I had to camp outside his house and for about six weeks. Little signs, slipping notes under his door, begging. He was wearing a wig. I didn't recognize him. And um, I thought it was Fran Drescher. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It finally just wore him down. That will do it, you know. That, that always does. Uh, I, as I've said before, I wouldn't have probably done something like this for any other composer, but I've... It's almost been such a perfect pairing that I almost thought it was too obvious and have avoided it for so many years. But um, then I felt that there was such a <laughs> landscape of modern music that I had to stand up and represent a path paved bravely by him. <laughs> well, likewise, <laughs> it, was a, it, was a, it was a similar thing from my side because um, had they come to me and asked me, a list of uh, artists which I would like to see, uh, Manson's name would have been on there having already tried to procure his talents on an earlier film and been shot down very quickly. But in this situation with Disney, I, I would have thought, I have, I have even less chances than the last show. And they came to me and said, we're thinking of putting together this project. Here's who we're interested in. And they listened to me and they said, Marilyn Manson. I go, what, you're saying this to me? <laughs> I said, well, you definitely have my blessing um, if you could make this happen. So uh, it was kind of funny because there was a five-year delay between when I went out there trying to bring Manson into a project, and then finally here's a project, and Disney's coming to me with his name. I said, this is just too crazy. Um, it's, uh, I took one picture with Mickey Mouse at yeah. the Pirates of the Caribbean premiere, and that's what it that's what you have to do. And it just goes you to show you. Take a picture with Mickey Mouse, and then you can. These things pay off. Who did you, know, you take picture a picture with Mickey Mouse? <laughs> hey, those, you know, those pictures <laughs> weren't supposed to get on the internet, but they did. Oh, those. Can, ones. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was yeah. totally Manson's show. I mean, I was just like a godfather. I was like, you know, Corleone in in a back room, going, Here, "Here's some and going, yeah, that looks like a good idea." Hey, yeah. So that was my <laughs> entire uh, association. Um, you know. I was very concerned about it being true to the orchestration that he had originally done, uh, even if we did it with different uh, instruments, with keyboards or with guitars and things like that. So one part of it was staying true to him, and the other part of it was it not sounding like me singing to the original. So it was a fine line of that, and I was happy that he liked it when he heard it. Yeah, I was really pleased. And had we talked before he cut the tune, I would have just encouraged him uh, to do whatever he felt he should do and wouldn't have given him any direction at all because I think that would be probably a negative thing. So had we, which we didn't, I wouldn't have said anything but do your thing. You know? Nobody said anything. That's the problem. So it's probably like uh, when you did it originally. <laughs> because if someone had given me direction, I, I might have probably taken it. But I actually, you know, was able to be very schizophrenic and musically and sing all these different characters. And then originally when I said I did it in, sang it in two days and the first time I sang it was as one performance. So... I was surprised how embedded it was in my system because I knew it, even though I didn't think I was going to know it when you sit down. It's like when you go to do karaoke. It seems like when you're singing along, you can do it. Then you get up in front of a bunch of drunk Asian women. Everything changes. But Everything. Yeah, it's, it changes you. Um, I, I, I then went back and I thought I wanted to make it <clears throat> as much like the characters but I suppose sounding like one person. So I think I ultimately did what he did. Instinctually, my way has always been to go against what's obvious. So this would be something I would normally avoid because it just seems too right. And then I just felt like maybe it's right for the for a reason, and um, the song ended up making me want to make a new record. I sang, and then I suddenly got excited about music again. So, um, 
I think the I think it really covers a lot of generations. I mean, uh, we're kind of from a similar time, and uh, but then I meet people that are much younger than me that like it and know it better than I do. I actually had to consult someone younger than me to wow, interesting. to recite the lyrics. No shit. Yeah, I like to have young girls sit on my lap when I sing. Yeah. Who doesn't? I know. Just a. I didn't say I did. I just said I like to. <laughs> I was, that's what worked for me when I was doing the demos <laughs> in the first place. But uh, uh, it's market research. Market so research say. shows that that works well. But when I created it many years earlier, I mean, obviously, I wasn't thinking about it connecting with any generation. Um, but like Manson is saying, um, you know, my approach when I did it was just to kind of go against the grain. And at that time, musicals all were very Broadway in a certain way that didn't connect with me at all. And the one thing that Tim and I talked about trying to make happen with the nightmare was that any, the songs, we would try to do songs in a way that felt like they could be almost from any era, but not contemporary. So there was a, the whole like, creation of nightmare songs were um, a rejection of contemporary musical. And I knew that I would catch a lot of crap for it and I did. I mean, I got the worst reviews of my life and career for Nightmare and the music. I mean, I actually got this uh, woman from the LA Weekly, hysterical, don't f with Christmas, was her headline in the review. That's nice. And uh, it is good. I'd, let's see, I, find her I would have quoted let's, that. Let's She's alive and well, right? For the New York Times. Let's, you know, associate her with uh, the what would you call them, I guess, the uh, the uh, practices of prison. <laughs> Pre whatever. Yeah. I've never been in prison. Jail one, you know, let's put that was erased from my... Yeah, well, I, I... I was charged as a sex offender for having fornicating with a security guard's neck, but I was found innocent. I, I, I did a hard time. I a sex offender. When I first conjured up the ideas for the songs, I was, sh I was in a... L.A. County jail cell. Um, Shaquille O'Neal was my... Heard of. Yeah, he was in at the same time, and he was my protector. I was snowed into a hotel in the Billy Joel Allentown, literally, with Sesame Street on ice and Shaquille O'Neal for three days. See, it's amazing how things cross over in life, because he has this story about Shaquille O'Neal, and I was Shaquille O'Neal's bitch for three months in L.A. County. And we and both like Sesame Street on Nice. Exactly. So it's just weird, isn't it? When I did it, it was like very consciously, I'm doing a bunch of songs and none of them will even remotely feel like a rock tune. Uh, I wanted them to feel like they could have come from the 30s or the 40s or the 50s or the 60s, stopping around the 70s like this couldn't have been written. You know, I, my influences were Kurt Vile and Gilbert and Sullivan and, uh, you no, know. No, actually, uh, the... Folks being in theater where Kurt Weill first did the Three Penny Opera, I did uh, a sort of a cabaret version of my Golden Age of Grotesque uh, record when it came out, and I sang Alabama song there. Oh. It was very interesting. Mm. They don't normally let people like me in there. So I like Kurt Weill. Yeah. So I see where it came from. Yeah. And uh, so... Um, people say, I really like that door song you did. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, everybody... There's several generations now that think it's a Doris song, but, you know, that's natural. Um, however, there's probably a generation that... Uh, yeah, they're going to think that I wrote Nightmare Before Christmas. Exactly. And then, you know what... So I'm going to take all the credit for it. It's fine with me. <laughs> it's absolutely fine. So, um, but uh, it was a... The idea was not to sound like rock. That's why it's so ironic and weird that that would come around... I think, what is this now, 37 years later, since it was written as a rock <laughs> tune. And um, I also got to hear the theme to Pee-wee's Big Adventure played by Primus in a live concert in New York. Oh, I thought you were going to say your cell phone. No, with a... Th <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> no, I do that. I saw, I saw about like a thousand kids uh, in a great mosh pit circle to um, Pee-wee via saw. Primus. So... You know, it's weird how things kind of come around. And of course, I never expected when I wrote this tune back in 37, 
um, did I say 37 years ago? It was 37 when I wrote it, that it would find its way to uh, Manson's version now. You know, it's like you just, these, these things are impossible to imagine when you're doing them at the time, and especially that thing at that time, which seemed such a bizarre, off-the-wall project. And, you know, and I think, as I've mentioned many times, it, by the time it was coming out, it looked like no one was going to ever see it anyhow. So it was almost like a, a moot point. It was, a, it was already per perceived as a failure before it opened. Well, that's the, always the big drag pressure thing about film music. It's that you do a lot of them, and there's a lot of music. So I've done 60 scores and you know, 60, 70 minutes in each one. So when you're doing that much music, you know, and I'll do maybe three in a year, it's hard to not, you can't not duplicate yourself. And uh, so I'm always aware of having, falling into a trap of doing something that, yeah, everybody knows that's what I do and it's easy for me to do. I try to not do that as often as I can, but sometimes I can't help it. But that's always an internal pressure that I feel. Um, and the only way around that is just not maybe do one film score every two or three years. And uh, it just doesn't I, work I out personally, that way. just as a fan, was impressed that everybody perceived a certain. Uh, I guess cartoonish or like more of a fun kind of element to what you did when you started doing some darker things that it, it was great and it worked and it really kind of kept, kept you from being known as just one thing. Well, thank you. I mean, I'm still trying not yeah. to be known as one thing. No, I think it's, it's just known as something that's quality that people like. Like a brand name. Yes. <laughs> right. I've always done, I think the things that I've considered to be outrageous aren't really the things that have stood out to people. Because I don't, what people find to be outrageous a lot of times is very normal for people like he and I. Um, yeah, I would say that's true. Yeah. So it sounds funny when we're talking about necrophiliac love stories that he wants to make a movie of because you know, just the sentence itself, normally. Provokes which, the... Which kids you sitcom. should... Sitcom. Yeah, kids, you should not have necrophilic love affairs. Doesn't I should just, just say, Disney instructed me to inst tell people, do not have necrophilic love affairs, or take LSD, or wear black panties when listening to my version of his song. These things all should not be done. That I had to say, I was required right. by law. Don't do <clears throat> But uh, I, I think maybe what doing the track inspired me was to be less afraid and, and less ashamed to uh, be a singer. Because um, sometimes, because despite popular belief, I can sing. Unfortunately, I didn't mean to when I started. Uh, but I've grown to like singing and I forgot about it until I did this so the new stuff that I started recording after this sung in a very different way different type of range and things like that and I for one can't wait to hear it I can't either because I'm making it up I'm it's the blackouts again <laughs> didn't no, really no. go in the studio at all did you no he f he f***ed with Christmas I'm helping bring the f***ing with Halloween back because I've always really not been able to enjoy Halloween because I'm me. Uh, so, you know, there's two holidays in one killed. He's introduced that, you know, not everyone could kill two holidays at once. <laughs> well, we thank Tim Burton for that, actually. <laughs> I'd, and I just helped. But I, I couldn't anticipate, you know, working on that uh, thing that it would have any lasting effect at all. So. If all the things I worked on, if there was any one that seemed like it was going to fail, that I would be most pleased about, that would find an audience after many years, it would be this project because, uh, um, you know, usually I'm on a film for three months, uh, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, and here I was on a film for the first time in my life for two years and three months. And so when it looked like it was dying, it really, it just killed. And uh, so to have it, a, a decade later, it was suddenly like, you know, people are slow, they're into that, and there's like a, it's like still out there, uh, was 
a, a very weird surprise, but like I said, out of the 60 things I've done, if I was going to pick one that I would go, I, I just wish that that one would find an audience down the line, because they never do. Films, they just never do. They, when they die, they die. And, you know, one out of a million will have the luck of becoming a zombie and coming back to life later, and this is one of those lucky zombies, but this would be the one, because I, you know, I was real proud of it, and Tim was really, his whole design and everything he put into it was brilliant, and all, every, you know, Selleck, everybody worked so hard on it, and kind of looked like, no one's going to see this thing. It's like, F it sucks. And then, years later, I'm in there with Tim Burton in Tokyo. Uh, this was just a year ago, opening for Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and there's Jack Skellington and Sally stuff all over the toy stores, everywhere. And it didn't really dawn on me, really, until then, that it had, in a subversive way, entered some kind of uh, undercurrent and moved around. Like a, it got caught in a riptide of uh, some current and spread, and uh, it was a great feeling. I, I was excited to be a part of kind of declaring its longevity. I think that's what this re-release does. It kind of well, thank puts, you for that. Puts it in, it puts it in the... I guess alongside all of the other Christmas movies, like uh, the Santa Claus, which is another favorite of mine. I never saw that. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Thank you guys so much.